they say Palm Sunday? Yeah. All right. Uh, it's good to be here today. I'll try to be brief. Um, I want to share some things with you today. I talked about some of this Wednesday night. So I'm not going to go over all the scriptures that I read because there were a lot. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of summarize what I was talking about and, and some of the things that the Lord has put in my heart. You know, he's been doing with me uh, for a while now about some things. And he continues to speak to me and give some revelation about this. And what I want to talk about today is about Joseph. You know, you know his story. Joseph had 11 brothers, and his brothers hated him. And one day he had a dream, and he told his brothers the dream, and they hated him even more. And he had another dream, and his brothers were jealous of him, so they plotted to kill him. But, you know, the Lord intervened. He prevented that from happening. And instead, they decided to sell him. So they, sell, they sold him to the... Ishmaelites. I finally know how to pronounce that word because I looked it up. Uh, and then he was sold to Potiphar after that. So, you know, Joseph was sold. He was going through a trial, but the Bible says the Lord was with him. And because the Lord was with, was with him, he was made overseer of Potiphar's house, and he was blessed. And as a result, everything in the house was blessed as well. Then another trial came to Joseph's life, and this time it was through Potiphar's wife when she lied about him trying to get her into bed. And because of this, he was thrown in prison. So although he was going through another trial, the Lord was with him. And because of this, the keeper of the prison put him in charge of all the prisoners. So then he interprets the dream of the chief cupholder and baker and all that. Whatever he interpreted happens. Then Pharaoh has a dream, and because no one can interpret it, chief cupholder remembers, oh, there's a Hebrew in jail that interpreted my dream. Maybe he can interpret yours. So Pharaoh calls for him. Joseph tells Pharaoh what the, dream mean, the dreams mean. And as a result, he's put in charge over all the land of Egypt. So as the dream said, prosperity came, seven years and seven years of famine. And during the famine, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt to buy grain so they could live. So he recognizes them and provides for them. And ultimately, in the end, he brings the family to Egypt. So all of this started because Joseph had a dream. Mm -hmm. But God's dream for Joseph's life was bigger than his own dream. God's dream for Joseph's life put him in the position that he was in when his brothers came during the famine so that he could provide for them and they could live. This was so they would not perish because from them came the line of Judah. Mm -hmm. So the Lord reminded me recently that it is time for me to dream again. And I have a dream, it's a big dream, but God's dream for my life is greater than my own dream. Mm -hmm. Now I ask you, do you have dreams? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do. They're big dreams, but God's dreams for your life are bigger than your dreams. Mm -hmm. God's dream for your life is for you to be his child, for it is written, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. John chapter 1, verse 12. God's dream for your life is for you to be saved, for it is written, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, verse 9. God's dream for your life is for you to have provision. For it is written, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verse 19. God's dream for your life is that you have healing. For it is written, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, yes. that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Yes. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. God's dream for your life is for you to be reconciled to him, for yes. it is written, but God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Mm -hmm. Romans 5, verses 8 through 10. And I could go on and on about this, but you get my point. So you have a dream, but God's dream for your life is much bigger than your dream. The Bible is God's dream for your life. Yes. Take it, start declaring it over yourself, and watch the miracle manifest right in front of your eyes. Yes. That's what I have this morning. Yes. So with that, I open the floor for questions. Anyone has any prayer requests or testimony they would like to share? I think we should, uh, sorry, pray for what happened in there, um, based on the information that's being shared by the media, which you got to take it with a grain of salt, but apparently the guy was targeting uh, Christians mostly with uh, the way how he was approaching the situation, so let's just pray for comfort for the family of all of those that were impacted by this, and, and for all of this to go away, you know, can't continue living like this, but let's remember that Tim's Sally is there in uh, Missouri, uh, did a wedding yesterday and prayed for her to travel safe back and that uh, the Lord had moved in the wedding situation. Also, uh, Shaley, my granddaughter, uh, our granddaughter text or messaged me yesterday that uh, Tiffany, the young lady who's been coming on Wednesday nights, uh, her mom was diagnosed with leukemia. Uh, we 
we've been praying about that situation. And uh, Tiffany is normally lives with her grandma in West Des Moines, but her mom lives in Altoona. She's had some issues um, <coughs> taking care of Tiffany. Um, so Tiffany, first of all, uh, needs to, we want the relationship with the Lord to develop with her. Um, but yesterday, Tiffany was over to see her mom and, and found her unresponsive. She's in the hospital. Mm -hmm. She's uh, was unresponsive. She's in IS, ICU. Um, Shaley messaged me this situation, and I didn't understand it until a little later on that Shaley is up there with Tiffany. And uh, I asked if they want me to come. She wants me to come up because she said, can you guys pray on Sunday morning for Tiffany's mom? So I'm doing that right now. But the second thing is, um, Shaley, Shaley has a healing anointing on her life. Uh, I've seen her pray for people and they get healed. Um, I was struggling with, uh, my left knee was really bothering me, what, three years ago, Tammy? Mm -hmm. And she came up and prayed for my knee. My knee basically caught on fire and I haven't had an issue with it since, okay? Um, she needs to understand the authority that the Lord has placed in her. So I don't, by rights, I shouldn't even need to go down there. Shaley needs to pray for it. Tiffany's mom and her mom get healed, get up, and walk out. Okay, so stand with us on that if you could, please. Amen. Um, my friend Karen um, has breast cancer and is not responding well at all to the um, treatment. He's really, really ill, very sick. Just keep her in prayer. Uh, also, my Aunt Mary, uh, I think I said like back in March or April, she had that big growth on neck and we prayed and got you know, one one chemo and then she just said no more, no more, God's will be done. That totally diminished but now she has some um, tumors or something going between her neck and her, her breast area so we're just praying again. The Lord mm -hmm. did it once, he can yes. do it again. Yes. Otherwise she's ready to go. She's way up in her 80s, almost 90 but, but uh, God's will be done that she suffers no pain, don't have to die from cancer. Praise God. situation around us. Father, we declare that your truth will be revealed not only to us, but to all this world. Father, we declare that all of the things around us are circumstances, are a lie, that are trying to trick us into believing what is not true. And the truth is your word, Father. We declare that we are healed. We declare the healing on those that are in need of healing right now to manifest in your mighty name, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for bringing families together for the reconciliation and the restoration of relationships, Lord. We ask that you reveal to us what our calling is to this world and what our authority is. Our purpose. Continue to guide our steps. Uh, Such the path that you have laid before us. Such Lord. We are stronger than you.
black bank I was in some uh, text and it said do you want to know who the bravest person in America is the second person that said they were a Christian after seeing the first one being killed we need to be that brave and no matter what we're facing we stand in the word of God no matter what happens because uh, our reward is not from this world have our Eastern Gate House of Prayer, and we're going to focus on Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Do you have anything you want to add? It says it all. All right. <laughs> if you can come, I strongly encourage you to do so, because there's nothing like it. Amen. All right. So let's speak the word this morning. Would you not remind us again that your people may rejoice in you? like overcast, the overcast sky is outside trying to invade in here. Um, the Lord reminded me <clears throat> of those that stood up in their faith the other day. They're dancing mm -hmm. joyously before the Lord. And I, I just thank God for those that did. Hallelujah. I, pr I pray for those right now that know the Lord. And when that question was asked, they cowered back and they hid and did not stand up just as Peter three times 
cowered back. And I know that they're feeling guilty right now because they did not stand up for the Lord. But as Peter was asked again, do you love me? Let these that are being discouraged right now, besides the grief of their friends, gone. Let them be restored and let them be strengthened right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. No, no, I don't feel any shift. Yeah, it's lifting. Y'all pray for Lee. Could you pray for Lee? Could y'all gather around Lee and heal? I, I know she's to be healed right now. I know she's to be healed right now. Hallelujah. 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 I'm not going to rush this. Hallelujah. Tim, can you pray over your wife? Declare it. Declare it. Yes, Lord. Oh 
Pity from the pit is full of emptiness and wrath And the fire that we ran by the same the blood of the Lamb Yes, I'm saved By the blood of the Lamb Yes, I'm so glad I'm so glad I'm so glad so I want to thank you, Lord Lord, nobody rescued me, nobody would dare. I was going down for the last time, by his mercy I've been spared. Not by work, but by faith, to him who is called. For so long I've been hid, for so long I've been sought, I've been saved. By the blood of the Lamb, I've been saved. By the blood of the Lamb. Yes, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm so glad. I want to thank you, Lord. 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 Things can change in 45 minutes. I love your sweet presence, Lord. celebrating and praising the Lord and we'll open it up and everything you know there's just like the kids and grandkids when they running around and so excited and everything I just feel that's where I'm at with the Lord when we're praising do the high praises of the Lord just loving on the Lord and then we get to a point we're supposed to continue on this morning and it'll just change because I heard a father saying hey yeah I love it you know what y'all doing hug you and I want to hold you close. I just want to hold you right now. I just want to love on you. And I love it when you're running around the excitement and everything else like that. The Lord's saying right now, I just want to hold you. I want to hold you so close that you can hear my heartbeat. That's close. That's close.
Lord gave me this song, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago, on the Ford Metro. And it was the same realm. It just came out of heaven. It's nothing about me because I'm nobody. But I hear the I hear roaming in this room right now. Because he is holy. Words are easy, you're holy, holy Lord.
so lost in worship when Mike told me, go ahead, Suzanne. I was like, okay, I'll just sing a play. I was like, oh, wait, you meant go. <laughs> I was just wanted to worship the Lord. It was so beautiful, so precious to have those times with him, so intimate. Our God is with all of us, but yet every single one of us individually. It is so special. And he has different relationships, just like we do with our children or our grandchildren. We have different, unique relationships with every one of them. But we are all precious to him. I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for so many things. Children, I guess they're already gone downstairs and I have to dismiss them. <laughs> they know. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, housekeeping. Um, so I'm just going to kind of continue on from what was spoken here. Um, I really felt like last month at the September Eastern Gate House of Prayer, something happened. And I feel like whatever happened there, there's been resistance for the fruit of it. <laughs> and I feel like it's building until we come to the next house of prayer. And so I'm going to just kind of pick up, um, Peter shared something and I'm going to completely paraphrase him. I'm probably get it all wrong. I'm just, this is my, this is what I heard you say, Peter. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, that happens all the time, right? Well, this is what I heard Peter say. He said that he saw the Lord roaming over the United States, looking for somewhere to land to bring his presence. And when he passed over Eastern, Ga Eastern Gate House of Prayer that night, that Friday night, he saw an ember, mm -hmm. just a small coal still burning. Mm -hmm. And he was pleased because he knew that he was welcome here in this place. And as Peter shared that the following Sunday morning, I knew that God was saying that he wanted to pour out his presence here in this place like never before. And that may be even what Mike even said. I couldn't remember if that was what I was hearing or what I was hearing, <laughs> but I heard it. His Holy Spirit will come and will fan these embers. Those embers are our desire for his presence. He'll fan those burning coals and make us a roaring flame, lighting up the atmosphere with right. his presence, right. his glory, his kingdom. Yes. And immediately I remembered something that Nathan shared when he told his pastor in Texas that he was coming to Iowa to start a church. And I've talked about it many times because I think it's so significant that we can misunderstand something so completely. He told his pastor he was going to come back to Iowa, where he was from, and start a church, and his pastor looked at him and said, Iowa? Why Iowa? Everyone knows that Iowa is a twice-burnt-over field. I, that came to me immediately when Peter spoke that. Yes, maybe it is, but there's coals. There's people who are still hungry for the presence of God, and this house is one, I'm just getting goosebumps on my goosebumps. This house is a place. The fire has never died. Maybe the rest of the, maybe all around us there's charred and burnt remains, but this house is still smoldering, is still yes. hungering and thirsting yes. for God. 
this field still smolders. There are still a few of us hungering for his presence. Besides, how many of you know that once a field is burned, after a season of healing and rest, Mm -hmm. that becomes the most fertile ground? And the next time something is planted, watch out. The harvest will be greater than it ever was in that land before. And that is what God is telling us. And did you know that as fire burns something, it changes the molecular structure of that which is burnt? It's not even the same thing before it's burned and after it's burned. It changes the very molecular structure. And what is left is a whole new substance. Our God is a consuming fire. And once his fire comes and burns in our hearts, we are never the same. Only he doesn't destroy. He makes all things new. Just, I always think of, whenever I think about God being a consuming fiber, I always think of Moses and the burning bush. The bush was not destroyed, but it burned. That's us. God's fire comes, and it brings life, and it brings abundance wherever it goes. That is where his presence dwells. It only destroys the works of the devil. It only destroys that which is not of him. Sickness, disease, Poverty, lack, oppression, addiction, you name it. That's what's destroyed by the fire of God. Because that is his very presence, his essence. God is love. I've always thought of fire is love. When we're praying for revival fire, we're praying for the love of God to be poured out in a way and manifest in a way as never before. And then as I'm thinking about all of this, I'm sitting in the pew and I have to get a piece of paper out to write because God's just like talking to me. And I'm just like, wait, I got to write it all down. The next thing I saw is that I'm a tree. This makes no sense except, I guess, the field, right? I'm like, okay, so I'm a tree, and I'm planted on the side of the river. And as you guys all remember the prophecy that Nathan had about the river coming out of this place, right? So we are planted on the banks of the river in this house, in this place. And I don't know about any of you where you live, but where I live, you got to dig through the clay pan in the soil to have anything survive in your landscaping. You got to get through the clay pan. It's really horrible. It's thick. You got to go until you hit something and then you keep digging. Otherwise, nothing can grow. And as I was sitting there, I saw that my roots got through that clay pan. That roots pressed through into something new, into a new place where there, that, that under, those underwaters, those, and I just keep thinking the deep places. My, our roots press through in this house to the deep places. And I just knew that that meant there was a growth spurt coming. Because how many of you know, once a tree gets through and once it reaches that, whew, like I had weeds this summer. They started as, uh, my, my oak tree just went crazy with those little helicopters last year. And I apparently didn't get them all cleaned up. <laughs> I had little trees and then we had rain and then we had sun and then I had knee high trees to go pull. I had to dig some of them out in like a week. It's crazy. But that's us. We are all those oaks, and something has happened. There is, there is nutrients available to us. That those deep places are opening up to us, and that means that we can manifest the growth of it out here. Yes. And I saw a mighty forest, and God said, "You are oaks of righteousness." I, had, I I thought I had read that somewhere, but I heard it loud and clear. We are oaks of righteousness. And I thought of the redwoods, which aren't oaks, but I I remember as a child, I went to the redwood forest in California, and I thought, my goodness, these are big trees. You can drive the Volkswagen through them, and you still aren't even, you know, that tree, you just got a hole in the middle, like a house, a door, hobbits live in them. I don't know, they were huge, huge trees. And God said, that is nothing compared to my oaks of righteousness. And so that's what I'm excited to talk about, oaks of righteousness. Are we ready for this great growth spurt that's coming? This forest is about to break loose and reach for the heavens and bring heaven down to earth. So this comes, and where I read it was in Isaiah 61, verse 3. And this was a song we were going to sing this morning until the Lord, he just put it on there to give me courage this morning. (laughs) He put it in the lineup to encourage me to know I was on the right track. We ended up singing it. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The um, Amplified translation says oaks of righteousness, and that's where I had read it. 
and those in the Amplified Bible, oaks of righteousness. We are a planting of the Lord, and we bring him glory. The bigger we grow, the broader our leaves, he gives the growth. We can't make it rain. We can't make the sun shine. All we do is reach. All we do is hunger and thirst. We thirst and we hunger and we press in and we press in. That's all we have to do, and God does the rest. He brings the increase. We start, all of us, there's just a tiny seed, right? Someone threw a seed in our life. Someone spoke the word into our life. We were just a tiny little seed. We needed water. We needed sunshine. And what, just, that, just that time of, of sunny, sunny time, whatever, growth, right? So let's go to what Jesus taught about the seed and the sower. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. And Sheila, just pull up 3 through 43, and I'll just kind of skip through. I won't read the whole chapter, I promise. <coughs> Matthew 13, we'll start at verse 3. We all know these parables, the parable of the sower. Is it 43? There is no um, okay, well then, let, hang on, let me get there. Then I'm making it up. Let's go through, oh, 1343, there should be. Oh, yeah, sorry, Matthew 13, verses 3 through 43. I'll kind of skip through here. So Jesus spoke in parables, right? Because it was his way of making sure the seed was protected for those who could hear it and preserve it for those who weren't ready to hear it. And so let's start in verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. And the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the s oh, Sorry. that's okay. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit: some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so this is telling us that there's good ground, there's really good ground, and there's great ground. And then there's the stone and the sand and the other places. And so then he goes on in uh, 18, let's go down to verse 18, Sheila. And Jesus explains it because the disciples are like, all right, you're speaking in crazy talk. I don't understand what you're saying. You're giving us these stories. What do you mean, Lord? And so Jesus tells them in verse 18, Sorry, it's okay. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. This is what it really means. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then come, cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. But hath he not rooted in himself but doeth for a while. For when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and this deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that received the seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So thinking about what Roberta was sharing, there's some people who just aren't quite there yet, right? They're just not quite mature in their faith. There's some people who hear it and have no idea, want nothing to do with it. This, the enemy comes and steals it. They think for a second, well, maybe they have a hope, and then the enemy comes and just pulls it right away. Then there's those who, who really want to understand it and receive it, but they just don't have the maturity. They don't have the ruts yet. They, maybe they don't have people in their lives to encourage them. Maybe they don't. things in this world happen, circumstances happen. And then there's those that have the good soil. And if we think back in our own lives, I was, all, I was all three of those kinds at some point. I was a child, and I wanted to understand, but then I became a teenager, <laughs> and the cares of this world choked out whatever word I got as a child. And then I became an adult, and I was thirsty, and I was hungry, and I became a mother. And I thought about not me, but my child, and I wanted to sow seed in his life. What kind of mom would I be if I didn't have anything to share with? Because as a parent, we share seeds with our children through the fruit that we bear. 
That's how we feed our children, is through the fruit that we bear. And so I can relate with all of these. I don't have judgment on any of these. I've been all of these. And then, next, in 24 through 30, he immediately goes to the parable of the wheats and the tares. And this is something that I've been thinking a lot about as well. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the householder came and he said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And he said, Nay, lest we gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So they grow together, right? There's good seed, and then there's bad seed. And the enemy loves to sow bad seed. And he sows it all around us, and he tries to sow it in us. But the bad seed, it's not, it's not for us to worry, right? It's not for us to worry. We don't have to distinguish. God sorts it all out in the harvest. And next is the parable of the mustard seed, 31 and 32. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge and the branches thereof. Now, I've never thought about all of this being together, but as we know, there's no chapters and you know this was all just written. So one thing leads to the next. So we go from the wheats and tares to the mustard seed. And then we go back to, in verse 36, Sheila, just put on the 36 through 43, and so then the disciples go, okay, Lord, go back to the wheats and tares. I didn't quite get that. Can <laughs> you explain the wheats and the tares? And so then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be waiting, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears, let him hear. Well, that's encouraging, right? That's super encouraging. It has to be, right? It has to be. And that's why it's so important that we are sowing good seed. That's why it's so important for us to help people distinguish between the good seed and the bad seed. If we are, the seed to me is, is the wheats and the tares are religion and law and grace. It's so important that we help people understand the difference. And we know that there's a mixture out there. And there's no such thing as a mixture because then it all becomes the law. And so, um, let's see. Uh, let's go to Mark 3, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4, verse 3 through 20. And we'll go through the other parable of the sower. I'll try and tie it all together. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let them hear. Uh, and I'll just keep going uh, where Jesus explains it, 10 through 13. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. 
And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower, the sower soweth the word. And let's go on through verse 20. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And they, these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endureth for, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entered in, choked the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some one hundred. Uh, and then let's continue uh, to 21 to 32. Mark chapter 4, verse 21 to 32. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall be manifested, neither was anything kept secret but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear, and what ye measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. Um, For he that hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So once the seed is planted in good soil, the tree can grow, and eventually will produce fruit. But the fruit that we are supposed to produce is the fruit of the Spirit, as described in Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And the message translation of Galatians chapter 5 to me is the perfect description of distinguishing between the wheat and the tares. The tares of religion, law, and slavery, and the wheat is the spirit, grace, and freedom. I'm going to read Galatians, I'm going to read the whole chapter out of the Message Bible. Christ has set us free to live a free life, so take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. I am emphatic about this. The moment any of you submit, submits to circumcision or any other rule-keeping system, at that same moment, Christ's hard-won gift of freedom is squandered. I repeat my warning. The person who accepts the way of circumcision trades all the advantages of free life in Christ for the obligations of a slave life to the law. I suspect you would never intend this, but this is what happens. When you attempt to live by your own religious plans and projects, you are cut off from Christ. You fall out of grace. Meanwhile, we expectantly wait for a satisfying relationship with the Spirit. For in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard of religion amounts to anything. What matters is something far more interior, faith expressed in love. You are running superbly. Who cut in on you, deflected you from the true course of obedience. This detour doesn't come from the one who called you into the race in the first place, 
And please don't toss this off as insignificant. It only takes a minute amount of yeast, you know, to permeate an entire loaf of bread. Deep down, the master has given me confidence that you will not defect. But the one who is upsetting you, whoever he is, will bear the divine judgment. As for the rumor that I continue to preach the ways of circumcision as I did in my pre-Damascus road days, that is absurd. Why would I still be persecuted then? If I were preaching that old message, no one would be offended if I mentioned the cross now and then. It would be so watered down, it wouldn't matter one way or the other. Why don't these agitators, obsessive as they are about circumcision, go all the way and castrate themselves? It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as, as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you'll be annihilating each other, and where will your precious freedom be then? My counsel is this. Live freely, animated and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sin, sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with the free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are antithetical, so that you cannot live at times on your own and at times in another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes, divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, I could go on and on. This isn't the first time I've warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard, Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to be forced into our way of life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessity is killed off for good, crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or as a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we are, not, we are not to compare ourselves with each other as if one of us was better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. Every seed is different and unique. Every tree in the forest is different and unique. It is not for us to distinguish between good ground and bad ground. It is not for us to distinguish between good seed and bad seed. We are to live a life poured out in love. We are to live a life of the Spirit. Our whole purpose in this earth is to be fruitful and to multiply. And I don't think that it just means making babies. <laughs> it is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of Suzanne, the fruit of Roberto, the fruit of Tammy, the fruit of Don. It's not the fruit of anybody. It's the fruit of the Spirit. We are just the branches that people pick the fruit off of. The fruit that we bear is the love of God. It's his love. It's the gift of grace. It's a free gift that we receive that we are to freely pass on. 
We bear this fruit for others to eat, for our family, for our children, for the people around us, so that they can taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. They need to taste for themselves. We all tasted the fruit somewhere along the way in our lives, and we decided that God is good. Yes. I have tasted and I have seen God is good. Yes. People need to know God is good. Amen. And we get so hung up in, oh, is it good ground? Is it bad ground? Is it good seed? Is it bad seed? I read all that stuff, and it doesn't matter. Exactly. It doesn't matter. It is not our work to distinguish, to get caught up in all that. It is for us to simply to live the life of the Spirit, to stay connected we need to be nourished and to grow. We need to be concerned with bearing fruit. Exactly. If we need to be pruned, we need to be connected to the source of the water. We need to make sure we're in the sunshine and not in the darkness. That is all we have to do. We just need to make ourselves connected with the things that make us grow. And we need to prune away the things that would hold us back. There's insects, right, that come and spoil the fruit. There's insects that come and cut off the branch before it can even form. There's all these things. <laughs> Not that I, I have a visualization of a monkey coming and eating the bugs off of each other. You know, they go to the zoo and they'll clean each other and they'll, they'll, you know, they'll clean each other. I just said, that's what we're to do for each other, right? Maybe I can't see you behind me. Maybe I, I mean, that's what we're to do to encourage each other, to stay focused. And when we bear fruit, that brings glory to God. When other people receive and taste that fruit, that brings glory to God. When we show growth and maturity, have you ever seen those mature trees? A storm can come. They're not falling down. They're going to shake, and they might lose some leaves. They might lose a few branches, but those trees are not going anywhere, and we are oaks of righteousness. Let's go to Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 11. We need to understand who we are. I know Nathan says that all the time. And I always think I do. And then he says something else I didn't know. So I admit that maybe I don't know everything about who I am. And this was the song that we were going to sing today. Isaiah 61, verse 1 through 11. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, excuse me, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I feel like that's what happened here this morning. We traded that spirit of heaviness for the garment of praise, that they might be called trees of righteousness or oaks of righteousness in the Amplified the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And the strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame you shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. That is good news. Amen. And I've got to tell you, most of that has already been done. Every, well, everything in there has already been done. It's all been done. That is, we are, that is who he is talking about. That is us, the church, this day. He has already done it. So 
So as we grow, as we become taller and wider and more fruitful, we become a beacon of refuge for those in need, those that are hungry, those that are thirsty, those that are hurting, trapped in addiction, you name it. We are planted on the banks of a mighty river, just like it describes in Revelation 22, that, that tree of life that covers both banks. We show the way to the river of life so that they might be filled and people might never thirst again. It is our job to continue the work of Jesus, to sow the seed. We are his seed. We are his offspring. We are brothers. We are kings and priests. It is our job to continue the ministry of reconciliation, to share the good news. 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 17 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, sorry, 17 through 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So part of my job as a municipal advisor is to reconcile the cash and the whatever of my clients, right? And so reconciliation means I have to account for every single penny, right? And so that's in the world of finance. Well, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the reconciliation that we're accounting for is sin. And um, I looked up kind of definitions, and Webster says to the, the definition of reconciliation, to reconcile, to restore friendly relations between, to cause to coexist in harmony, making or show to be compatible, and three is to make one account consistent with another, especially by allowing for transactions begun but not yet completed. In the Bible, the Greek word, uh, it's uh, G2643, means to exchange. Reconcile means to exchange of the business of money changers, exchanging things of equivalent value. The adjustment of a difference, reconciliation, a restoration of favor. Um, in the New Testament, uh, let's see, in the New Testament of the restoration of the favor of God to sinners that repent and put their trust in the expiatory death of Christ. And I looked what that word, I didn't know what that word meant. And expiatory means able to make atonement for the means by which atonement is made. And we know what the currency, the equal value of sin is blood. It is in the Old Testament and it is in the New Testament. And so atonement is the satisfaction or the reparation for a wrong or an injury to make amends. And that's what Jesus did for us. He gave his blood to atone for all the sins of the world. Now, I would say that that is a pretty good deal on our part because he took it all. And if I had to reconcile, think about a, think about a ledger. I don't know if any of you guys took accounting, but if I have a ledger of all of the debits and the credits, I have all the sins of the world for every human being that ever lived, yeah. and I have the blood of Jesus. Yeah. That is an equal exchange. All of the sins of the world, everybody who ever lived or would live, ever, 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 I would need a book. I probably don't even have a book big enough and I have the canceling credit, the blood of Jesus. Exactly. It is finished. Yes. Now, what we need to do is let everybody else who still is looking at this side of the page to let them know their debt is canceled. Yes. People, it, it's so hard to wrap your brain around the massive gift of grace. Exactly. It's too good to be true. All of this, now, now if I just took my sins, right, all of this, the stuff I don't even know I'm going to do yet, and the blood of Jesus, it's too good to be true, but it is. It yes. doesn't change the fact that it is. And there's this, as humans, we want to, we want to, well, it's, you know, we want to martyr ourselves, right? We want to find a way to, oh, prove to God that I love you, that I'm so thankful, that we can't just say thank you. You know, and, and Nathan always uses the example of grandkids. I don't have grandkids, but my son, right? When he wants to give me, I give him something. I don't do it to get anything back. Right. He can't give me anything of equal value back. 
There's nothing he has of equal value of me paying for his college, right? There, he can't give me that. Maybe in 20 years, but you know, or when I'm you know old and gray and I'll be calling on him. But, but he can't. But I'm not doing it because of expectation. I do it because I love him and I want him to have a good life and I want him to be set for the future. I don't expect anything. But yet we can't believe that our God, our good and gracious God, can do this for us. It's so hard. It's much easier to give than to receive. I don't know if all you guys feel that way, but I always think it's easier to give than it is to receive. I'm a horrible receiver (laughs) because I want to give. I want to make it up. I want to give you something of equal value. But God said, no, just enjoy it. Enjoy it. Live it. Eat the fat. Like Nathan always says, eat the fat, drink the wine. Enjoy it. Live a life full of joy and happiness. And go tell everybody else that they can live a joy. A life full of joy and happiness. That is the fruit. It is not up to us to make the soil good. It's not up to us to decide where to sow our seed. We just share the fruit. We just hang it out here and let people come pick it. Oh, but what if someone takes advantage of you? Let them come pick the fruit. Let them taste and see. They're not tasting me. I am connected to the vine. I am just, I'm a planting of the Lord. I'm a transplant of one little branch from the tree of life. We are all transplants from the tree of life. We are oaks of righteousness just here to give good fruit, to feed everybody around us, whoever can come. We don't have to worry about the tree next to us. We don't have to worry about the forest. God takes care of it. But we have to bear the fruit. So, we all have opportunities to share our fruit. And that's one thing I love about this church is we hear testimonies every week of somebody that came and picked our fruit. We had an opportunity to give someone some fruit and say, just come. Just taste it. It's good. It's good news. And so we get to hear how God moves. And so, okay, this is kind of cheesy, but I thought it was kind of (laughs) good. So God wants us, he told me, we're going to read out loud Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. He's deputized us. Do we understand that he's deputized us? We are ambassadors of heaven. And so we're going to say it out loud together. And this is, this is just think about how God is telling you, this is how I see you. You are my ambassadors. You are here in authority. He has sent us in authority. And he wants us to read um, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3 out loud. Okay, we ready? This is, this is me, right? This is you, this is you, this is me. I'm saying it. I, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So you are deputized. You are now ambassadors of Christ. This is our job. This is our job description. This is what we are called to do. He has laid it out for us. Jesus went into the temple on the day that this scroll was pulled out, and he read it and he said, this day the scripture is fulfilled. Telling every one of you, this day that scripture is fulfilled. We have been deputized, we are ambassadors, and so we are called to be bold. We are kings and priests, we are joint heirs with Christ. This is our inheritance. This is our inheritance. We get fired up. I heard some. I, I don't know. I heard it in the prayers. I wrote it down that we get fired up at football games. We have cheerleaders saying, "Get fired up! Yeah, fired up, team, go team!" I'm telling you, we are to get fired up. We are to light up this world. We are salt and light. We should be speaking the word and expecting, exactly. expecting these things to happen. Exactly. Listen as others come to you, searching. You're gonna just just pay attention. Just have ears to hear and eyes to see. People will come to you. They are searching. They don't know what for. They don't know what to ask you for. They don't know how to they don't know how to verbalize this thing they're feeling, but they just feel like you have an answer for them. You have something that they need. They don't know what. They don't know how to express it. I'll never forget the day that Darlene I asked Darlene about her church. I didn't know what else to ask her about. She said, let me tell you about Jesus. 
And I ended up in the bathroom crying and finding someone that I thought I knew as a child, but he was new and he was different. And something changed that day. If I wouldn't have asked the question, if she wouldn't have heard what I was really saying, I wouldn't be here. And I want to see this place filled with people who tasted the fruit that we have to offer. This place filled overflowing with people who are free, who are living a life free. So let's get fired up yes. and let's go change this world in yes. Jesus' name. All right, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> Thank you guys, everybody. See you Wednesday.